can gang warfare in El Salvador ever be defeated? A state of emergency has been imposed to curb fighting between rival gangs. What's the reason for the increase in gang crime? And can the streets be made safe? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashem Ahal Barra. He calls himself the coolest dictator in the world. President of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, has also been responding to criticism of a crackdown on violent gangs. Critics say the government's get-tough approach being used to intimidate them, as well as to limit the civil liberties of all Salvadorans. More than 22,000 arrests have been made since Bukele declared a state of emergency in March. International rights groups say arbitrary arrests are common and police routinely infringe basic rights. Despite that, Bukele has an 85% approval rate, the highest of any leader in Latin America. We'll hear from our guests in a moment. First, this report from John Holman. This is the image that the El Salvador government wants to transmit. Another suspected gang member off the streets. His tattoos giving away his affiliation to a criminal band. They've arrested more than 20,000 people in the last month and a half as they seek to clean the MS-13 and bury away teen gangs out of neighborhoods they've ruled for decades. But this also is an image of the crackdown. One of many women saying goodbye to a husband or a son as they disappear into the Salvadoran prison system. Here are others. I love you, son, she's saying. In March, after a murder spike, the country declared a state of emergency. That meant people could be arrested without a warrant. The Salvadoran Congress has extended that state of emergency till late May. Police continue to round up young men en masse. Inevitably, along with the guilty, human rights groups say the innocent have been taken. Marta Andalus told Al Jazeera her son's one of the latter. He sells face masks to hospitals, she says, and helps her get by. Now she's used a quarter of what she makes in a month at a market stall to try and free him. I don't know why the president is doing this to innocent people, people that aren't guilty. Fine, someone's done something, they should pay, but they're not guilty? At least she knows where he is. Other women are going from prison to prison trying to find their relatives. Look at the crowd here. And the crackdown goes on. In the Italia district, a well-known MS-13 stronghold, soldiers question and search everyone going in and out. But an overwhelming number of Salvadorans approve of President Nayib Bukele's actions. We have stopped paying extortion. We're not paying anything now. The gang members haven't been seen. They have practically disappeared and business is flowing. People are no longer afraid to come to the city center and walk the streets. So many have suffered extortion, rape, killing, that even if some innocents have to suffer, others believe that's a price worth paying if they can simply be free. The question is if at the end of all the arrests, confusion and brutality, this will actually work. John Holman, Al Jazeera. Two main rival gangs operate in El Salvador. The Mara Salvatrucha is more commonly known as the MS-13. It originated in the 1970s in Los Angeles and is estimated to have 50,000 plus members, both male and female, in various countries. The enemy is the Barrio 18 or the 18th Street Gang. It also has its roots in Los Angeles and with a multi-ethnic membership more than 50,000 strong. Both gangs are estimated to make millions of dollars a year through illegal drug trafficking, robbery and kidnapping, to name just a few in a long list of criminal activity. Let's bring in our guest in Washington, D.C. Carolina Jimenez is president of Washington Office on Latin America. In Manchester, Colin Harding is Latin America analyst and director of Latin Forum a consultancy and information service on Latin America. 
Also in Washington, D.C., Hector Silva Vallas is a Salvadoran journalist and senior research fellow at the American University Center for Latin America and Latino Studies. Welcome to the program. Karina, how should we characterize the weekend murders in El Salvador? Are they an act of defiance by the gangs, uh, their way of saying to the president that his uh, zero tolerance approach is not working? There are several theories around why, you know, that weekend uh, was so tragic and we saw this incredible uh, spike in the number of, of homicides committed allegedly by gang members. But what I think is clear and what that, you know, weekend reflects is that uh, criminal activity uh, and, and, and the power of guns is still a very present reality in El Salvador perhaps because the root causes of that violence have not been addressed. When a country implements uh, what we call in Spanish the mano duro, uh, mano duro policies, these are like hardline, iron fist policies to address citizen security problems, the results is often very short term. And, uh, you know, the, I see the causes uh, that create or that generate situation of violence that is spread over a country are not truly tackled. Uh, so what, what, I, what I think we saw on that uh, very tragic weekend uh, was uh, a situation that has not been solved, that could repeat itself despite the policies being applied uh, right now, or, or perhaps because of the policies being applied right now, and, and the need uh, to have a solid response, but one that responds to a comprehensive approach to address violence and that doesn't focus so much on this, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah, iron fist measures that do not go into the root of the problem. Okay. Colin, so you have President Nayib Bukele, who has been saying for quite some time that it's because of his policy, his approach, his toughness when it comes to dealing with gangs and gang crime, that there's been this decline. But suddenly you have this string of crimes taking place over the weekend. Do you see it that way, that the government has failed to address the root causes of the problem? I think that's certainly arguable. I mean, there is one theory, which is a, a political website um, has come up with, that, uh, in fact, what Bukele had done, he'd reached a deal with the, uh, with the gangs uh, to uh, lower the levels of violence in return for certain privileges. Uh, and that this is broken down, and that that's that accounted for the sudden spike in, in, in murders. Now, the, the, he's always denied, Bukele's denied this, and, and there's no uh, public evidence of it, but it, it does sound quite plausible, because certainly the, the murder rate in El Salvador has gone down dramatically since, you know, since it was the most violent country in the world in around about 2015, and it, it was down to a much lower figure uh, last year. Um, but I think it's correct, uh, what the previous speaker said, that, that uh, the root causes, whatever they may be, have not really been gone into, that uh, having spent lavishly, which is a thing that makes Ed Bukele very popular with many Salvadorians, um, he's uh, avoided making mm. any sort of structural changes. And uh, uh, if, if this deal that he supposedly made has broken down for whatever reason, um, this may be the, the, the gang's way of protesting against, the, against his attitude. We'll talk about the root causes. We'll talk about what's happening, what the government is doing, who are these uh, gangs. Uh, but in the meantime, Hector, when you have 62 people killed on Saturday, the most violent day in 20 years in El Salvador. Could, it th could this be a message particularly from the most aggressive of all these gangs, the MS-13, saying that we are now gaining the upper hand as far as El Salvador is concerned? Yes, I think they have had the upper hand for quite a while right now, uh, until now. Uh, I would say that, uh, in fact, my thinking is that the whole Bukele presidency is based in a pact of some sorts with the, with the two big gangs, because these gangs have held uh, territorial control over great portions of the country neighborhoods, uh, suburbians and Salvador, the countryside, the big cities, for 25 years now. And there hasn't been any government that has been able to address that. Uh, these gangs are pretty hardly embedded in the 
in the social uh, fabric of El Salvador and the way that not just Bukele, but Bukele and other politicians have managed to deal with that territorial control is by uh, making truces or pacting with them. That's the, that's the, this pact, I think there are enough evidences now that there's an ongoing pact with the gangs. And that is a, some somewhat um, a fragile pact at some points. And I think what happened, as Carolina said, mm -hmm. In the and the in last uh, in that weekend is that the gangs were actually making a statement. Something happened. We don't know exactly what happened yet within that pact uh, that um, it had a ripple effect. And the gangs that uh, effectively those were the gangs saying, "Yes, we are here. We hold the control of these territories. And if you don't comply with whatever we're asking, uh, this is what what's going to happen. Okay. We are perfectly capable of doing this anytime." Carolina, so the president takes credit for what he describes as an unprecedented decline in the uh, street crime in El Salvador. But we all know that this is something that started in 2015, four years before he comes into power. Should he take the full credit for this or this was the result of a political process that started way before Nayib Bukele? I think he takes credit one week and then he shows uh, the week after that he has to do something because you know what he took credit for is no longer uh, is no longer happening. Uh, I don't think. I mean, I think Hector made a, a very good point. I mean, gun violence in El Salvador is not a new phenomenon. It's unfortunately thousands of Salvadorians have been victims of you know. Uh, gun violence for, for decades now, and they do control, you know, important parts of the territory, etc. Uh, so the decrease in violence, it's, it's just part of a cycle that repeats itself and comes uh, with, an in, with a, an increase in violence because the root causes are not addressed. So I think he can't take credit for, uh, you know, uh, a day without homicide, and he will tweet about it, zero homicide today. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, weeks later, he has to take that back because uh, homicides are increasing again. So I don't think uh, the administration of Najib Bukele has been successful at mm -hmm. reducing violence. OK, Colin, so for quite some time, we had top Salvadorian officials coming out and saying that they have been doing all it takes to clean up the streets until an investigative media outlet, El Faro, said, wait a second, maybe there is some dodgy politics here. The government is now being accused of striking a deal with MS-13 and MS-18. What is what it implies, perhaps the government told these groups to stop killing people in the meantime, do whatever they want to do, just to give credit to the president that, that he's doing good. Well, that's a, there's certainly some uh, documentary evidence has been uncovered that, that, that some kind of deal of that sort was was reached. And as I said earlier, the, the one theory is that this sudden spike of violence is because this deal has broken down for, for whatever reason. And this is there, as has been said, this is them making a statement that, look, we can turn on the violence, turn on the taps of violence, as one of them put it, uh, whenever, they, whenever they choose. And it's worth noting also that... Uh, the, the sudden crackdown that Bukele has, uh, has gone in for, in, in fact, a reversion to the previous government's policies. A previous right-wing government, the traditional Arena party, had a policy called super heavy hand, in, in which they, uh, they, they, they flooded the streets with military, they rounded people up in much the same way that uh, Bukele has done. And the effects were uh, uh, negligible in terms of a long-term change in the situation. Hector, is this something that could potentially tarnish the re reputation of uh, Nayib Bukele, the fact that right after those revelations by Al-Fahr, we saw the US administration uh, putting restrictions and imposing sanctions on top officials affiliated with the president? Yes, and I think this is a developing story because, uh, yes, in fact, this whole gang issue has put uh, uh, the Bukele administration at odds with, the, with Washington. Uh, as you know, Washington has been the traditional ally of El Salvador since uh, uh, a lot of time now. And one of the reasons that it has become bitter is because uh, uh, actually the investigation that El Faro put out was based in great part in investigations by a, by a joint task force 
of uh, Salvadoran officials and U.S. officials in San Salvador. So, so the U.S. is pretty aware of this. And actually, the U.S. has asked for the extradition of 14 MS-13 leaders. And the Bukele administration, well, his attorney general, uh, a guy that was named by Bukele, mm -hmm. has denied that. And the Supreme Court uh, has denied that. So uh, this is, is, is uh, as I said, a developing story and will and, and okay. have put the Bukele administration at odds with Washington. Carolina, we have here at the very center of this debate is two of the most brutal, notorious gangs in uh, Central America, the Mara Salvatrucha or the MS-13 and El Barrio 18 or the MS-18. Why, why, why are they so powerful in a place, small country like El Salvador? I think... Um, you know, El, El Salvador is a country that hasn't truly uh, dealt with its legacy, mm -hmm. you know, of war. Uh, there was, a, as we know, a, a very violent, a very tragic civil war. And unfortunately, you know, the process, the, the necessary process, uh, process of justice and reconciliation has never been uh, truly, you know, uh, supported by, by the government that, that came to power after the war ended. Uh, to that, you also have a country that has, you know, very, very troubling uh, social economic indicators. I mean, a large percentage of the Salvadorian population live in very marginalized communities and do not have proper access to education, you know, and to basic rights and ba basic services. So countries with that, you know, when, where, where you combine that with, you know, what is also a very important uh, uh, part of, of Salvadorian society, mm -hmm. which is having a very large diaspora, in this case in, in the United States, and a, a diaspora that, you know, uh, it also been deported in large numbers in mm -hmm. many instances. I think you have a combination uh, for this type of uh, criminal groups to, to you know, to, to be born. And, and we know that deportation have a lot to do with the creation of the Maras in El Salvador, uh, but also to flourish. And, and, and then, uh, you know, combating uh, criminal uh, violence with state violence is always a recipe for disaster. And I think it, at the, in the long run, makes these guns uh, more powerful. I see your point. Colin, now when you have gangs which manage to set up parallel armies in a place like El Salvador, maybe taking advantage of the legacy of the country itself, violence, civil war, and so on and so forth, you have others saying that this is just an excuse by the government, the clampdown itself, just an excuse by a government trying to further clamp down on political freedoms and freedom of expression just, just for the president to further consolidate his grip on power? Well, it's certainly part of uh, Bukele's uh, style, political style. He does see himself as a providential figure. He's, he's part of the, the sort of populist uh, phenomenon which we've seen in many different parts of the world. Uh, when he was elected uh, in, two, in 2019, he just swept away the tra two traditional parties which had uh, alternated in power for a few years in, in, in El Salvador uh, and with a, a great personal following. And he, he's cultivated his personal image, you know, the, the, the reverse baseball cap, the, uh, the constant uh, social media posts, uh, the uh, travelling around and uh, addressing crowds and so on. He's, he's very much got his own personal brand. He was a former advertising man and knows all about such things. Uh, and yes, I mean, there, there are uh, indications that he, he finds um, uh, democratic controls mm -hmm. and, and, and civil rights and so on a little bit irksome. And, and then if they get in the way, he's really not interested in them. That's why he's replaced judges with people uh, mm -hmm. who might be troublesome with people uh, loyal to himself. Hector, when you look at the sequencing of events in El Salvador, state of emergency followed by major reforms of the penal code, which, uh, which implies sentences of up to 45 years in prison for uh, gang membership. And also you have the uh, new law which regulates the way social media operates, particularly when it comes to reporting on the crackdown on, on, on the gangs. People see it differently, see it as an attempt by the government to just build a, a dictatorship in El Salvador? 
Yes, I think uh, actually I, I am pretty sure that this so-called crackdown on the gangs, what it is, is a crackdown on democracy. But this has been uh, the, the, the plan of Nayib Bukele since day one. I think, I truly think that he had a plan and that plan was to consolidate power, uh, 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 amount power over his overwhelming popularity. First part of the plan was to take control of Congress, which he did by popular vote, and then take control of the, of the, the other institutions. Uh, and then what this crackdown has, has uh, helped him do is precisely that, is uh, to finish this path in which he ambitions in, himself as uh, uh, to be reelected in 2024. And in order to, to do that, uh, he needs that overwhelming popularity to stay as mm -hmm. it is. As long as he's loved by the Salvadoran people, he will be safe in power. And in order to do that, he needs to get rid of uh, uncomfortable voices, those of critical journalists or the political opposition. And actually, if you look at the, at the reforms, especially those to the, to the, the penal code, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, they are aimed to, to, to silence those voices. Karina, we, we have running uh, short on time here. When you look at uh, the pattern of the gang violence, we're seeing the same pattern in Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, groups splintering because of the fight over a, a territory. We see that the Barrio 18, for example, splintered into the southerners and the revolutionaries and something that has the potential to just to further create more violence and instability. Is this something that a government like Salvador, a tiny nation of seven million, can handle? Or this is something that really needs Pan-American policy? Yeah, I think, you know, in general, eradicating violence, uh, especially when it comes to this type of guns that, as, as you very clearly point out, are not necessarily uh, a problem of one country, but have spread to, to three or more countries, require broad and comprehensive strategies. So I do think we may, we may need, you know, some regional strategies. But there are definitely things that a country like El Salvador could do. You know, you, you need a comprehensive approach to tackle this type of gun violence. Uh, that includes, you know, justice reform, mm -hmm. uh, independent criminal investigations, community-based interventions, and those things could be discussed and debated if the president would listen, you know, to experts, to human rights organizations, and, and to citizens. But I don't think the president is listening. I think the president is tweeting, and, and as you know, my colleagues have been saying, amassing more power uh, for, for other reasons beyond, you know, controlling and, and, and ensuring that Salvadorians can have uh, a life uh, free of fear and, and violence of that. Okay. Colin, uh, what should be the first priority in places like uh, Salvador and Central uh, America in particular? the need to tackle instability, violence, armed groups and drug trafficking or gangs? Because ultimately, as long as those are there, the gangs will continue to thrive. Well, yes, they're all intimately uh, interconnected, are they not? I mean, the, the, the gangs will turn their hand to any of these like, activity that raises money for them and extends their, their control of the local communities, whether it's uh, arms smuggling, drug smuggling, extortion. I mean, the, the extortion of the bus companies, for instance, is, is, is prevalent throughout Central America. Um, so, they, they, you know, they, they, there's no way of separating the, 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 the two. Uh, just one other point is, 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 that I'd like to point out is that about whether Bukele is going to listen to <clears throat> um, advice or, or uh, suggestions. He, he's not not particularly keen on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's actually defied the the International Monetary Fund over over his uh, making Bitcoin um, legal tender. I mean, he's been the first cryptocurrency country in the world uh, as part of his vision of, of creating a completely new country. Uh, and so when the IMF warned him that... Unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time, but I promise you that this is a story that we'll definitely revisit on Inside Story in the near future. In the meantime, Carolina Jimenez, Colin Hardin and Hector Silva Avalos, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hashim Ahabara and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.